are you all doing? Awesome to see you all this morning. I know it's a little bit chilly out there, but it's glad to have you all here this morning. Just uh, by way of a quick advert, if you do have Twitter, follow hashtag crucifixion live. We have the crucifixion running over the whole weekend, and we're going to be tweeting things on Twitter. So if you have Twitter, follow hashtag crucifixion live from the youth department. It's really, really cool, and we've been having a, a wonderful time and a wonderful blessing. DTR. Some of you will recognize these letters and what they stand for. How many of you know what the letters DTR stand for? Well, for a young man in a relationship, these letters strike fear in their hearts. They dread the DTR talk. It makes single men so uncomfortable, they will only use the initials DTR. The objective is to postpone, to run away, and put off DTR for as long as possible. In fact, many men are so afraid of the DTR, they will deter to terminate the relationship when they sense that the DTR talk is imminent. Now, do you all know what DTR stands for? Define the relationship. This is an official talk that takes place at some point in a romantic relationship to determine the level of commitment. You define the relationship and then you decide where things stand. Is it casual or is it committed? There comes a point when it's important to define the relationship and you see if things have moved past infatuation or admiration and moving towards deeper devotion and commitment. And how you feel about the DTR talk is determined by how committed you are to the relationship. If the relationship is one of convenience that you just want to have as a casual weekend thing, then you feel uncomfortable, you will feel anxious. Your mind will be flying with excuses. You may even have a fight or flight response. Some of you may have had those feelings because we are going to be having a DTR talk this morning. I want you, you to define the relationship between you and Jesus. What exactly is the commitment level? Now, I'm going to warn you that some of you are going to feel a little uncomfortable, maybe a little anxious. You might even have a fight or flight response because you kind of like the current arrangement that you have with Jesus. He seems like a good guy. You like having him come down to us or do something. To, you like going to see him on the weekends. What it comes down to, though, is this. You want to have a relationship with Jesus with all the benefits but with none of the commitments. A no-strings-attached arrangement where you can connect with Him from time to time, but it really doesn't mess with your life. You want to be a fan of Jesus, but not a follower. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus puts it this way. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Followers deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. A fan is simply defined as an enthusiastic admirer. And the DTR question is this, are you a fan or are you a follower? As you read through the Gospels, you will find example after example where Jesus will put people in a position where they must choose. Sometimes there were large crowds following him, like in Luke 14 and John 6. And Jesus would preach a sermon that would determine who in the crowd were fans and who were followers. Jesus was never impressed by the size of the crowd. It's the commitment level that he cares about. A concern I have about our churches today is that when we gather together, I think there is the possibility that instead of a community of followers, we are more than a stadium, we are more like a stadium full of fans. Where we wear a cross, but we don't bear the cross. You come to church, know all the songs, you open your Bible and take notes, you walk out to your car with a Jesus fish on the bumper, and say grace before lunch, but that doesn't necessarily make you a follower. I think for years I was a fan more than a follower, in large part because I was confused about knowing about Jesus versus knowing Jesus. But there is a difference between knowledge and intimacy. 
I grew up thinking it was my knowledge and my good behavior that made me a follower. I loved Jesus. I knew a lot about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. I wasn't talking to him about my day. I wasn't listening to him speak into my life. See, a lot of us don't mind Jesus once a week at Sabbath. We don't mind making some changes in our lives, but Jesus wants to turn our lives upside down. We want him to do a little touch-up work, but Jesus wants a complete renovation. We come thinking tune-up, Jesus comes thinking overall. We come thinking a little makeup is what we need, Jesus is thinking make over. We think a little decoration is required, and Jesus wants a complete remodel. But the truth is, that it is only in letting Jesus interfere with our lives that we find real life. Jesus didn't come to this earth so that we would be better behaved or to tweak your personality or fine-tune your manners or smooth out your rough spots. He wants total transformation. The objective of the gospel is not to make you a well-behaved person, but to turn your life upside down. Jesus didn't come to change me, but to kill me. When I quit fighting for the controls of my life and surrender everything to him, when I die to myself and live for him, I find life that is truly life. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says that if we want to follow him, we must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. But at the end of this chapter, Jesus gives three examples of people who are potential followers but are shown to be fans, just enthusiastic admirers. And here's what we find. What keeps them from following is really what keeps most of us from following. We read about the first fan in Luke 9, verses 57. Luke 9, 57, and it says the following. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Notice he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Wherever. He's at least talking a good game here. He says to Jesus, I will follow you without reservation. But look at verse 58. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay down his head. So Jesus draws the attention to the fact that this man loved comfort more than following him. And maybe that's what's keeping you. Because, of, because the call of Jesus to take up the cross and following him is in direct conflict with our desire to be comfortable. We are by nature comfort seekers. I once saw an ad on the TV of a thing called a Snuggie. Has anybody ever seen what a Snuggie is? A Snuggie is... Yet, when you first see it, you think to yourself, oh, you know, it's just a Snuggie, what a waste of time. But as you see this thing, you start thinking, okay, well, maybe there's more to this than what it is. And you eventually decide that, well, maybe this is a product that you'd actually like to have. And many, many in the world would like to have Snuggies because, I mean, what better way than to have your hands covered with your blanket and you've got little sleeves in them because that's what Snuggies is, like a blanket with sleeves. So you don't have to get up to pick up the remote. You can just stay where you are. But my guess is if you ordered a Snuggie and it arrived at your house, you would put it on and say, wait a second, I have one of these. Isn't this just a bathrobe you wear backwards? Now, a follower is not asking the question, how can I be comfortable? Many of us are not following Jesus. We're following comfort. We made comfort our God. It's what we live for, work for, and sacrifice for. But there's nothing comfortable about the call to follow Jesus. So as you determine the relationship you have with Jesus, let me ask you this question. Is the relationship one of convenience or is it committed? This man in verse 57 spoke words of commitment. But when Jesus painted a picture of what the commitment looked like, the man seemed to back off. I think there are a lot of people who have made a decision to believe in Jesus but never really committed to Jesus. You know, one of the news networks in America 
did a report on new vegetarians. And the reporter, age 28, captured this report. I usually eat vegetarian, but I really like meat. She represents a growing number of people who refer to themselves as flexitarians. Most of the time, they will refuse to eat meat, but once in a while, they make an exception. Christ explains it this way. Uh, so sorry, the, Christy explains it this way. This is the report. She says, I really like vegetarian food, but I'm not 100% committed. Flexitarian is a good way to describe people or how many people today, how they view their commitments. Flexitarians are committed until it becomes inconvenient and uncomfortable. So when it's that special, special fillet mignon, then our commitments can be adjusted. And that's the way the Christians approach their commitment to Jesus and to the Bible. I really like Jesus, but I don't really like serving the poor. I'm not really a big fan of going to church, but my resources are spoken for. I love Jesus, but this area of my life, when I'm with my friends, when I'm at this place, I'm not 100% committed. And so they will say, oh, I want to follow Jesus, but don't ask me to forgive that person who hurt me. Don't ask me to release that bitterness and resentment. I'm not going to let that go. I want to follow Jesus, but don't ask me to give a percentage of my money. I work hard for that. I'll follow Jesus, but don't talk to me about my sex life. I can't help my desires. We wear the name Christian, and then we pick up and choose the teachings of Jesus that we're going to follow, as if the teachings of Scripture were like a buffet, where you just look at what's good to you and don't worry about the rest. We would never do that, but that's what, that's what fans do. It's not unusual for me to talk to parents and who are concerned about the children in school and in colleges. And often parents want to know two things. Why did this happen when the children walked away from Jesus? And what do I do now? And there are no easy answers. Usually you can listen to their story and offer a little encouragement and pray. There was one pastor who was at a speaking meeting in America in Houston, Texas. And this good-sized Texas Ranger man came up to him with his huge big buckle on the front of his belt, and he came to him with tears in his eyes. And that didn't happen very often, but he tells the story of his prodigal daughter, and he wasn't asking the question why. He wasn't looking for an explanation as to why she wasn't following Jesus anymore. In one sentence, he put his finger on what he thought the case for his daughter was, and he said this, we raised her in the church but we didn't raise her in Christ. She grew up learning to be a fan of Jesus instead of a follower of Jesus. Most parents want their kids to know, to have a little bit of God. They want their kids to have some biblical morals. But one of the most dangerous ways to be raised is with a little bit of Jesus. It's like an inoculation. A little bit can, give you, can keep you immune to the real thing. It's like a marriage. It doesn't work to just if you don't have a whatever it takes, complete, committed approach. In verse 59, we meet fan number two. Luke 9, verse 59. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. One of the first words that God comes out of this guy's mouth is first. The first thing he does is to put Jesus off. I want to follow. I really do, but not right now. Now isn't a good time. We treat our relationship with Jesus like the diet we keep meaning to start. I'm going to start eating right as soon as I finish off this chicken chimichanga. And we do that with Jesus. First let me do this, and then I'll start. We put Jesus off like we put off going to gym. And so we say, I'm going to start tomorrow. This is my last time. 
when I'm out of college, when I get married, when I have kids, when I get a less demanding job, instead of getting out of bed, we just hit the snooze button. Just 10 more minutes, we tell ourselves. All experience that? Maybe you hear the man's excuse for putting Jesus off. He wants to go bury his father. And you think, well, maybe Jesus is being a little bit too hardcore. Let the guy go bury his dad. Well, most likely, his father wasn't even sick. This was a way for the man to say, when my parents die, then I will follow you. When I get my inheritance, when I know that they won't disapprove, then I will follow you. But his excuse isn't enough for Jesus. And I'm not sure what is holding you back. It may be something that seems legitimate. But Jesus says the time is now. And one thing I can tell you for certain is that the longer you put him off, the less likely you are to ever follow. The third fan we find in verse 61. says, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus isn't looking for half-hearted followers. Following him part-time isn't an option. He has no interest in Sabbath Christians who are following him, but are always looking over their shoulders, wondering if they are missing out or second-guessing their decision. Both the second and the third followers are dealing with the issue of priority. So let me ask you one, one other question to help you define the relationship you have with Jesus. Is Jesus one of many or is he your one and only? See, fans want to make Jesus one of many. And Jesus is clear that this isn't an option. Jesus says the most important command is to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's the kind of relationship that he wants you to have. Now let's imagine, and I must say this, this is strictly pretend. Remember this, this is strictly pretend. That this week you walk into a restaurant and you see me sitting at a table having a candlelight dinner with a woman who is not my wife. You come, and ask, you come up and you ask who the woman is and what am I doing? And I say to you that I'm on a date. And you say, well, what about your wife? And I respond by saying, oh, well, I still love her too. This isn't our date night. Our date night is on Thursday. I can date whoever I want the rest of the week. You walk away feeling angry and disgusted. You decide that someone needs to tell my wife, and so you call her and tell her. Well, imagine that I come home from my date, and you have already told my wife, and she meets me at the door, and she says, Hi, honey, did you have a nice time on your date? Now, this story is really getting fictional. Imagine how absurd that would be. You don't even have to know my wife to know that she'd probably react by having jealous anger. And as soon as I walk in that door from my date, I must fear for my life. And the Bible describes God as a jealous God. He doesn't want a one day a week affection. He wants your whole heart. Jesus explains that following him is not something you do part time or halfway. Jesus says it's all or nothing. There is a young man in the church who dedicated himself to following the the upside down way of Jesus a few years ago. And like, pretty, like many of us before and, and after, his story is pretty dramatic. A l- relationship with Jesus has changed everything for him. Before following Jesus, his life consisted of the words going out, drinking, smoking pot, and chasing girls. He'd show up at work with a hangover more often than not. He was full of anger and didn't know why. He felt like he was running in a circle and had no purpose. And was just kind of going through life aimlessly. But Jesus had brought a radical change to his life. And you can spend a few minutes with him and it's easy to see the joy that he has found in Christ. He's constantly at church, serving wherever he can. He's a single dad with plenty of financial struggles. 
But when he became a Christian, he decided that he would no longer work during church times, even though he needed the hours, and he would pay tithes, even though there were things were tight. Not long ago, a pastor met with him and his, with his mom. His mom wanted to meet up with him. So they met at a coffee shop, and he assumed that the mother was going to tell him what a wonderful job the church has done in transforming her son. Well, they met, and that wasn't the case. She was upset with the pastor in the church because, in her words, my son has taken this all too far. She was not pleased with how much time he was spending at church and how he always wanted to pray when the family, with family meals and how he was always trying to tell them about the sermons. And she was upset that he was giving away his hard-earned money. And here's what she said to the pastor. Can you please tell him that the Bible teaches everything in moderation. She said he's taking this too far and he needs to understand that it doesn't need to be an all or nothing experience. So the pastor gave her a pleasant smile, but deep down he was clenching his teeth and his breath was short and he felt his eyebrows narrowing and his nostrils were flaring. He felt angry and defensive. And when he feels like this, he said he always turns to Scripture And he quotes Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, You are neither hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus doesn't say everything in moderation. He says, you can't be my follower if you don't give up everything. And so the invitation hasn't changed. Jesus still says, If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. My favorite word in that invitation is anyone. No matter what your story, no matter what you have done, this is the relationship Jesus wants to have with you. Anyone, anyone who has ever laid awake at bed at night and thought to give up anything to undo what I've done. Anyone who has looked at themselves in the mirror and said, I can't believe what I've become. Anyone is an all-inclusive term. Anyone means everyone. Anyone means me. Anyone means you. Amen. I'm going to invite you to please stand with me as we do a closing prayer. Lord, often in life, we go through life just living day to day. But I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to define the relationship. That we'll answer the question of your fan or follower. Lord, there might be many hindrances in our lives. But Lord, don't let those hindrances affect us that we, res- we stop following you, Lord. Help us to put those aside. Help us to realize that they are unimportant to the bigger scheme of things. That we must give you all. All, all. Help us, Lord, the Sabbath to be reminded of that. Help us to be drawn closer to you, Lord. And as we evangelize in our cities and in the towns where we live, Lord, as we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, as we lead others to you, Lord, I pray that you will bless us and that you will guide us. We thank you for this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.